So Josh, I thought I'd, I'd pitch a slow one over the center of the plate for you to start with. <laughs> so in terms of energy use, is, uh, is COVID-19 giving us a bit of a respite from CO2 emissions and even climate warming? It's actually not as, not as uh, slow of a pitch as you might imagine. It's a little bit complicated. I think what we're seeing pretty clearly is that um, those types of energy use that are associated with being at home are increasing. So home heating bills and uh, in the summertime, home air conditioning, um, those things, those types of energy use are probably rising. Um, but what we're really seeing a lot of is a dip in emissions from transportation and particularly airline transportation, but also other forms of transportation um, seem to have, at least in, in March and April, taken a dip. That gets complicated because a lot of people, particularly in the developed world, are um, no longer taking public transportation as regularly for sort of mid-length commutes. Um, so I guess the answer is yes and no. There's less happening in the economy to produce um, greenhouse gases, uh, but there are certain activities that have ramped up, um, and particularly those associated with being, being at home. Yeah. So, so what are the consequences of this, I guess, change in energy mix? Do we know? Well, so... I guess we don't we don't know uh, per se. Um, there are people who are working on modeling this. I think we saw in the spring a pretty significant overall dip in greenhouse gases um, in the short term. Uh, I don't think that is necessarily going to persist or or has persisted. Um, there's a lot of momentum in renewable energy as uh, the price of oil is down, um, which I think is taking some people by surprise because conventional wisdom would say when oil is down, you build oil infrastructure, take advantage of the low prices. Um, I think what a number of regulators and um, renewable energy companies have realized is when oil companies are down, you kick them. Um, and kicking them when they're down means they can't fight back on regulation as, as readily, um, and you have opportunities in the market um, to, to roll out new uh, renewable technologies. So you see, I mean, currently, renewables are going absolutely gangbusters. If you look at, for example, some of the, um, the big uh, solar ETFs, those exchange traded funds that are, that are tracking the commodity prices of things like solar panels, um, they're, they've doubled since, some of them have doubled since August. Um, so I think the real question is this disruption in the market has created um, some opportunities for, for changes in the fuel mix. Um, and, and it's as much a market response as it is a response to, to the pandemic itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the fate of, 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 of mass transit, though. I mean, man, mass transit ridership is down dramatically. And I, I'm, I'm wondering whether some of them are going to survive this. Uh, it's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that question um, with any kind of certainty. Um, I think a number of uh, mass transit systems are supported by, um, for example, municipal bonds and, and other type of county bonds. Um, and they're not necessarily supported in the short term just by uh, ridership fares. Um, those are supposed to keep them uh, afloat in the long term, um, but it's possible that, um, that some cities and counties and even states can um, help public transportation systems weather that storm. I don't think that's going to happen everywhere. I think there's, there are some serious, some serious issues, and, and I think ultimately those um, places that have invested in more flexible public transportation, bus systems, for example, are going to be uh, have a better time responding to this than those that have built fixed infrastructure like light rail that they can't change. Um, oh, so I see. I, I think you're going to see again. There may be a shakeup in the way people are thinking about public transportation in the same way as a shakeup that people are thinking about the fuel mix. One of the things I wanted to explore in this is 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 the way in which climate change and and COVID nineteen are of banging against each other or, or exacerbating each other. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, there's a couple of different ways I think that these two things uh, interact. And, and the biggest one for me is that um, climate change has continued to put stress on, uh, on all kinds of social systems and, and exacerbate inequalities within societies, both in the developed world and in the developing world. Um, that overlaps with the way that COVID also affects um, marginalized and minoritized communities um, disproportionately to the larger population. So not only do you have um, 
challenges from climate change, like increased, and take, take it very simple, like increased air conditioning bills in the summer um, in, in places where that's tough to afford. Um, you also, those same people are being affected by greater healthcare costs and greater risks to COVID um, at the same time. So what's happening, I think, is that the same structures that make climate change disproportionately bad for um, the poor and marginalized make COVID disproportionately bad for the poor and the marginalized. So I think that's the biggest um, kind of overlap here is that um, both of these things magnify inequality um, and they magnify what it. Are there, what are there kinds of inequality? You mentioned air conditioning, but I'm just wondering, there's probably a whole host of other things that, that, that I'm unaware of. Some of them are very kind of local and spatial. So for example, um, there's pretty good research in places like, for example, Portland, where, where I teach, um, that shows there is less... Um, less foliage available to mitigate what's called the heat island effect, which is a sort of second tier part of climate change where when it gets hotter, um, asphalt gets hotter and buildings get hotter and cities get hotter. That's mitigated in part by planting trees and other plants. Um, you can see pretty clearly that there is less green space in minority neighborhoods and less green space in poor neighborhoods in Portland than there are in uh, wealthy white neighborhoods. Um, so that's one of these specific tangible examples where um, climate change is exacerbating um, an issue that already exists um, because those, those same um, green spaces uh, are associated with property values in those cities, um, in cities like Portland. Um, and a lot of these, I mean, th there's really good work being done actually at Portland State University about the way that these um, contemporary uh, climate inequalities uh, arise from historical redlining policies where uh, minority communities are denied um, high rated loans. And, but, but I mean, COVID makes this worse. It just affects the same people. So um, it, it's not so much that it makes property values bad or exacerbates the green space problem. It is that um, the same people who are living in the neighborhoods who whose property values are not increasing and who have a number of other sort of structural impediments also get hit harder by um, COVID and have fewer resources to deal with it. Yeah, and and I guess I guess we were you're sort of already answering the question, but I mean, no. Are these economic, are these sort of democratic disasters affecting all equally? And I guess not. The answer is no. I mean, I think that initially everybody thought, um, in fact, I think there was a lot of people who were really hopeful, not that this pandemic was going to be what it is, but, but that because the pandemic looked so democratic, that maybe this would reveal to people um, just the, the gross inequalities in the healthcare system. And I think pretty quickly that, um, that was given the lie. I mean, people began to realize that getting good care, good testing, and, and now that the next thing is going to be the vaccines, um, is it, it is indicated by factors like race and class, um, and in this country also ethnicity. Maybe it's not a completely different subject, but the politicization of science has 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 COVID made that worse? That's a really interesting question, and I think that this is one of the overlaps of uh, COVID and climate change that um, I'm not seeing a ton of in the press and that, that I really think is important. Um, so in some ways, climate change is like the original, not the original, there have been scientific controversies before this and they've been polarized, but climate change polarized science like almost no other issue in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, and even as early as the late 1980s, you had essentially corporate interests, Exxon and others, um, and there's, I think, Naomi Rescues in particular has documented the ways that they um, worked to sow doubt uh, in the public's eye of the, the findings of science. That's been enormously successful. And by the early 2000s, I think the sort of climate denier or climate skeptic movement um, is on the forefront of polarizing um, science, but also polarizing um, our political response to different types of information. All of that was exacerbated, I think, by the, the rise of social media, where people can live in their, their echo chambers. But um, the stage was really set by the time you got to 2019 for vastly different interpretations of scientific information and uh, political, politically motivated challenges to, to expert science. And there have been many issues that have fallen um, in this kind of category of, of behavior. But climate change and, and climate denial, um, because of the way that it's run down party lines in the past 10 to 12 years, um, really laid a framework for the response to COVID um, that ended up, I think, being really destructive. 
so what's the effect of this polarization? I don't know whether polarization is a better word or politicization, but whatever, you choose. Yeah, I mean, so I guess they're, they're not necessarily the same thing. I, I, I would I shy away from uh, politicization because I don't think there is a science that's apolitical. I think that's always, um, there's always some, there's always some reason that scientists are studying the things they do. They understand there's going to be these impacts. I don't think scientists are naive actors in society. Um, they try to insulate themselves from politics in their uh, scientific conclusions, but I think they are also smart enough to, to see that there are always political uh, implications. The polarization of science is a different story, wherein uh, a political leaning can now in the United States allow you or enable you to discount a whole line of research and a whole line of evidence in a way that I don't think has been the case um, prior to the 21st century in, in the United States. Um, and that, that polarization, I mean, where that goes, I don't know. Um, but where we are now, it, it's a sort of choose your own adventure of scientific in, uh, information where, um, you know, if, if the implications of scientific research don't support your political position, you just get to discount that scientific research. And that seems really destructive to me. Is this about kind of anti-intellectualism or elitism? Is it, how does that play? It, so it is, and that's, that's a longer story. I think, I think there's um, baked into the polarization of science, a distrust of, of expertise. And, I, and honestly, I think that... Um, the left has played into this in in some really, uh, some really kind of nefarious ways. In, insofar as there's a certain amount of elitism, um, and there's also been a failure, I think, not just in the left but in the scientific community more broadly, um, to to acknowledge some of the past mistakes or or missteps, um, even as the the scientific community continues to ask the public to trust them. Um, I think about. For example, you know, rolling out the vaccine currently. I don't think there's, for the record, I don't think there's evidence that this vaccine or vaccines in general are, are harmful. Um, but uh, I think there's a presumption in the way that um, the way that vaccine producers and also um, scientists who are, are promoting the vaccine present Western medicine that Western medicine has never screwed up in the past. And in fact, there's, there are a lot of, I mean, you can go back to the 50s and thalidomide, um, which, which you might remember, and it's in the Billy Joel song. Um, uh, but, but there's been many more uh, instances where, for example, the, the FDA approves something and then has to retract, or these are not infallible institutions. And I think there's a, a sense in which the presentation of infallibility um, really is, can be pretty damaging, even though I don't think the institutions themselves are the ones to blame for um, predominantly for the, the kind of anti-vax movement that's growing up. You know, one of the key points I got from your book, Behind the Curve, was that science has done kind of a poor job of, of communicating what they found and the urgency of what they found to the general public. Uh, is that fair? Yes and no. I mean, I think, um, you know, my book tracks climate change advocacy from the 1950s to really the early 2000s. Um, and in that period, in the main, I would say that that is true. I think there are two things I would like to, two points I'd like to make. First, simply the dynamics of, of this has changed. The scientific community has become emboldened to make um, stronger claims about climate change as the evidence has gotten stronger, but also as they've recognized the extent to which um, their voice is a political voice. So I think the last five to 10 years, scientists have been much more, um, much more aggressive about that, which I think is important. The second thing is that um, within the period that I'm talking about, even up to the present, there is a structural problem where scientists are held to the standard of political neutrality and, and they're, they're supposed to be a certain way. And that circumscribes just how they can talk about some of these political issues or how they've been willing to talk about these political issues. So um, in short, advocacy for, for action on climate change has in the past um, taken on the form of advocacy for more and better science with the, um, presum the presumption that more and better science, if you show it to the policymakers, is going to create change. Um, and that's where they've, they've kind of fallen down on the job is that um, 
for years and years, this was the model and it, it hadn't worked for a long time. Um, I think that, that that dynamic has also changed a fair amount um, in recent years. And you can see it in the way that scientists are working with members of Congress um, and, and putting some of that scientific neutrality behind them to, to try to frame their science in terms of, of real tangible um, policies and, and bills. Um, so if you look at the Green New Deal, for example, there's um, this whole, a whole just raft of scientists who were on board and helping write that legislation. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that you didn't necessarily see even 20 years ago. Yeah, I'm wondering whether basically scientific training makes some scientists um, sort of hesitant to go beyond the precise data they've collected. I mean, when I did the research for the, the, the book, this, I kept running into this. I mean, it have, you'd get a reviewer, for example, like when in, in the 1970s, there's this guy named Steve Schneider, uh, who's pretty controversial as a scientist. He published a book called The Genesis Strategy, warning about climate change. And the, uh, the reviewers, the peer reviewers um, of this book had major concerns that Schneider was overstepping his training and his, and his bounds as a scientist. Um, there's a deep discomfort within the scientific community about exactly this, um, overstepping the, the boundaries of your training and sacrificing that uh, authority of political neutrality. Um, and I think some of that still exists. I mean, you see that, um, you see some hesitation uh, from, for example, graduate students to engage with these sorts of things when their careers are still, um, still young and possibly in jeopardy. Um, so I think you're right. This is part of the kind of structural problem of having scientists on the front line of, of climate change politics, but they have to be because they, they understand it the best. And how did this change over the years? Because it, it seems like what you're saying is it has changed a bit. At a certain point, uh, enough scientists realized that they were going to get pilloried either way. Um, and that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, even their scientific publications, like, so they essentially unintentionally created a blueprint for, um, corporations and other interests who don't want there to be regulation surrounding climate change. And the blueprint is, okay, well, we don't have to fight a political battle. What we can do is just go question um, all the information in the science. We can go after the scientists where they live because they're not coming into our realm. And so these scientists, like, um, for example, Michael Mann at the University of East Anglia, they would publish their work and then they'd, they'd have, you know, um, scientists from, you know, Exxon or wherever um, coming in and just publicly lambasting them. And at that point, it's like, well, why am I trying to pretend neutrality in the first place? Why don't I, you know, fight back? And I think that's the last 10 years, you've seen a lot of scientists who are much more from the beginning, I mean, from their early graduate career, much more engaged with the political discourse um, as, as a motivator for what they're doing. Well, this sort of ties back into, at least in my mind, kind of the, the anti-elitism we were talking about earlier. And, and I wanted, you know, as a historian, how did, where did America get this, what to me seems like a fairly fervent strain of anti-intellectualism? Where does this come from? It's not just a fervent strain, it's a really long-standing strain of American anti-intellectualism. Um, and, and in part, it almost come, it, it, not almost, in part, it comes out of the kind of frontier mentality um, that uh, in many ways defined America's perception of itself uh, pretty early in in the nation's history, but it it gets flamed by uh, inflamed by populism at various points, but also um, by some of the the mistakes of of elites themselves. I mean, I think of, for example, the progressive movement, which is uh, an early twentieth century movement built significantly around rationalization and bureaucratization of uh, of services in the United States, and in many ways. There's a lot of great things that the progressives did. These are the, the early progressives. At the same time, some of their work is like tied up in eugenics and some really unsavory things and some assumptions about, um, I guess, the hubris of knowing how the world works and deciding for other people that that's, that's what you know. Um, so I think there's, there's ingrained in, in American history a tension between the, the uh, kind of do-it-yourself, I'll figure it out, kind of frontier mentality um, that, that we laud in American culture. I think that's great. And, um, and an intellectual elitism where we have these really great thinkers with really great ideas who can remake the world. Um, and those things often are, um, are kind of at odds with each other, particularly when governance is at stake. 
Uh, and is this um, is this a um, urban rural thing? Is it a caste system? I mean, uh, this split. What is it? Uh, that's you know, that's a good historical question because I think that split it looks a little bit different every time. Um, there's there's often I mean, obviously, there's a split in education because that's where the elite, anti-elitism comes from, or at least how it manifests. But in the past, there have been pretty big urban-rural splits and east-west splits, um, where you had educated in the east um, who uh, end up in government, and uh, you have a large population that tends to distrust um, those elites over time. I mean, um, there's I, I think there's always a racial component to this. Um, in, in part because um, the elites in the United States have for so long been exclusively white and often exclusively male because of the, of the structural um, impediments uh, for marginalized um, communities to enter the elite. Um, and I don't, I, that manifests in in different ways, usually at more local levels. Um, I think, for example, of the way that um, farm workers in California in the 60s and 70s began to question um, elites at uh, state health boards um, based on their day-to-day -day experiences with pesticides to make them rethink what they were doing with their pesticide regulations. And part of that is this, it's a, a racialized difference between the um, an elite educated class and the people who are actually experiencing these ills. So it, the anti-elitism is not always so clear cut as, as, you know, we might like to caricature as the uneducated versus the educated. There's often these sets of assumptions that go into um, expertise that, um, that really need to be challenged. Um, so it looks different in different historical periods, I think. Have we been here before a deeply divided society in the midst of an existential crisis or two? Well, we did have a civil war. Um, so, so that was a thing. I think, you know, if you want to look at, at um, messy, uh, messy times in American history and deeply polarized times, I think not just the civil war, but in the, the 1870s and 1880s, um, particularly during, during Reconstruction, there's there's a polarization there that um, it's also a great model for how not to move forward um, in <laughs> from this moment in American history, because reconciliation in the United States came at the expense of the black community um, and, and, and African-American rights. So um, those are some incredibly polarized periods, you know, the second half of the 19th century. Um, and yet I don't think we've been here before. I don't think there's a, a moment quite like this. Um, and, and I don't say that often or lightly. That's as a historian, I usually am, I pump the brakes on the, the kind of unique moment analysis. In this case, I mean, given the events in Washington, DC, um, in which the, the Capitol building was stormed, that seems like grounds to say this is something new. Okay, how do you see this playing out? <laughs> Um, well, that's a good question. Um, my, my cynical historian's hat, with, with that hat on, I, I suspect that we muddle through and uh, whatever major changes happen change relatively slowly in the, behind the scenes um, where there'll, there'll be big outward facing rhetoric of change that, that it sort of masks much smaller incremental changes. Um, if we muddle through and, and there aren't um, significant uh, significant changes to the way that political discourse unfolds and the way that we respond to the pandemic, I suspect that the people most affected will be the people most affected negatively by almost everything in the U.S., which are um, the poor, the racially minoritized, um, and, and to an extent, um, women. Um, so I think... You gender, race, and class are going to continue to define how this looks moving forward. Um, if I put my more hopeful hat on, I think there's a real opportunity um, as, as we deal with the pandemic to take advantage of some of the other things that are happening, that are happening like, for example, the realization among um, the financial community that there's a a viable new energy mix that is that is around or or that investors in in 
for example, pension funds and endowments really do care at the expense of, of the bottom line of the fund about diversity and inclusion and um, environmental impact. Um, mm. so I'm more hopeful. I, I do see some, some really positive things that, that might come out of this. In the short term, like what's going to happen next week? I have no idea. You mentioned the phrase muddle through. Is that is that good policy? Uh, it's uh no, no, it's not. It's it's just what we usually do. Are there policies you'd like to see? Um, I mean, I think there's some low-lying fruit. Um one one piece of low-lying fruit for, for climate change is is signing back onto the Paris Accords. Um another is to uh to commit to, if not the Green New Deal as a whole, at least elements of of the Green New Deal that began to couple reducing emissions with uh, creating and repurposing jobs in the United States. I think those are, um, despite the resistance that we've seen, those are pretty low-lying uh, options for, especially given the, the makeup of the Senate and the, the White House going forward. Um, I also think that um, healthcare reform is ripe at this point. Um, I think everybody realizes from the pandemic that something's got to change. and um, and so I think continuing that process that's kind of been on hold for the past six years or so uh, is another piece of low lying fruit. So I think there are some good policies that are kind of floating out there. Um, and those are the two that are two of them that I think um, per this conversation uh, are pretty promising. Well, this is really great. I'm, I'm really pleased that you made the time to talk to me about this because um, it's something I know I'm interested in. and. Uh, and I think, I think a lot of people haven't thought about the convergence of these two factors a lot. It's always good to talk to you, Ken. Okay. Thanks a lot, Josh.